Hey, it's Will. I've got a video here on configuring Rack AFX7 and using it for the first time. This is for people who are just starting out and who are using this product for the first time. If you've used Rack AFX6, the large majority of this configuration stuff is the same. So you can probably um, sort of skip this video or maybe stick around because there are a couple of little things that are different. So let's go ahead and get started. This is what it's going to look like when you first open it up. Um, it has a configuration file that it uses, and I've already uh, written my configuration file. So there's a few things here that have already been set up from the last time I used uh, Rack AFX. One of the things that you can do is configure the main interface to look how you want. And if you go to View here, there's a thing that says Customize Rack AFX GUI. And this is going to give you a bunch of options for how you want um, these, uh, sorry, how you want these fonts and colors and backgrounds to look. There are a whole bunch of separate options, and I'm not really going to go into that here. I'm going to keep the stock um, black background. These knobs are known as S6 knobs. I graphically copied them a little bit from the Avid S6. I've got a bunch of um, black and white knobs put in these slots, which indicate that there's nothing there. So uh, if you've watched the previous video on this, you know that there are 1260 control slots we can put stuff into. We'll work on that a little bit later. So um, after this video, feel free to go back in and reconfigure how you want these colors to look for your own sort of preferences. The first thing you're going to want to do is to go into preferences, which is right here. There's also a menu item for it, and we're going to set up some folders. First thing is the, the default project folder. Uh, it's going to default to an app data roaming location for you. I've already changed mine to, to put it right here, C Rack AFX projects. I like to keep the projects close to the root drive so that I can use parallels to shuttle projects back and forth for AU and AAX and VST, which are on Mac OS. There's a default WAV file folder, and this is the same one. I'm using the same one that you're going to get, and a default WAV file. Now, I want to change this. The default WAV file is the WAV file that's going to be loaded automatically every time you start a new Rack AFX session. And I'm going to change mine to slow groove 43. There are exported project folders. This is for when you do ASPIC exports, and we'll go over that in a separate video. There's also some information in here that you put about your vendor name and your email address and stuff like that. If you're going to sell plugins, you're going to need to want to do that. We'll also go over that in a later um, video. Finally, there's a section here, Visual Studio C++ Compiler. It's really important that you choose the one that you have installed. Right now, it's 2015 and 2017. Uh, 2019 support will be coming pretty soon. For 2017 in particular, uh, just to let you know, in previous versions from 2015 and back, uh, I could ask the registry where your software was located, meaning you didn't have to really do much other than tell me, hey, I'm using Visual Studio 2015, and then Rack AFX would go into the Windows registry and figure out where that was located. In 2017, for some reason, they, they quit doing that and they quit leaving that information in the registry for us developers. So if you do choose 2017 and you click Save here, a menu is going to come up and it's going to say, you need to take me and, and tell me where I can find uh, Visual Studio 2017. For, it's called devenv.exe. And if you go to my website and go into, into the uh, download page there, you can find some information on where that's usually located. It may not necessarily be in the same place uh, on any given computer, I suppose, because it's not in the registry. So that's one thing that you have to do. I wish I could fix that for you, but if that information isn't there in the registry for me, I can't really do anything about it. There's a few other uh, check buttons down here. I'm not going to really go over any of the other stuff except for this compiler OS save time. Uh, when you use Rack AFX, it interfaces with Visual Studio. And I do a lot of saving from Rack AFX, meaning I, I issue commands to Visual Studio to save everything the way that it is so that you don't lose any work. If Visual Studio can't do that fast enough, then it's possible to get a desynchronization between the two. And if that happens, what you want to do is to use the slow or very slow save time. All that's going to do is add a couple of seconds extra when it goes in and does the saving. These days, I haven't seen that happen. This generally happens with old operating systems or operating systems that are terribly bogged down and everything's just running super, super slow. So if that happens to you, this is where you can get that set. I want to hit save because I did change my default WAV file and you can see that it's loaded right here. This combo box is going to hold all the WAV files 
that you open during any given session in Rack AFX. And the very first time, it's going to have your default WAV file loaded into it. So that's what's right here. Um, you use WAV files to test uh, FX plugins. For a synth plugin, you can use the built-in MIDI piano, which is here. You can also connect MIDI instruments to Rack AFX and use those as your MIDI input device. We're going to be doing FX plugins for all of these things. So there is a transport up here that will play uh, and loop uh, the WAV files for you. There is a setting in preferences to choose loop. I also have it mapped to the space bar. So right now, right as it comes up, it should play music when I hit the space bar. And that is indeed slow groove 43.wave. Now, if you don't get audio coming through, but you see the meters moving and you see the histogram down here moving, then you have a audio sound card setup issue. You can set that up right here. It says optimize audio and buffering. It's also over here in audio MIDI uh, in the setup audio, um, set up audio devices, um, right here, set up audio devices menu item. So when you do this, it will pull up and it will give you a list of all the drivers that are on your system. The driver type here is important because Rack AFX does duplex operation. You will need to have the input and output device be the same driver type. So when you select your devices over here, uh, in a lot of cases, um, you're gonna, you may have five of the exact same named driver with just a different driver type here. Make sure you set those up correctly. And if you use ASIO, which I do use a lot, there's an Ad ASIO setup panel here. You're going to want to have ASIO for your input and output as well. If you get glitching or clicking and popping when you're playing audio, you can increase uh, the size of the playback buffer here. You can crank it all the way down to 16 samples if you want to. Most people are going to need to have at least 32 to get good glitch-free operation. And if you're using a software synth, once you're down into 16 or 32, that's going to be automatically a, a pretty low latency for you. Uh, so get that number as low as you can get it without a lot of glitching or clicking in your audio. So once you've got that up and running and you've played audio through Rack AFX, you can see over here in the status window has told me a WAV file was loaded. Its name was Slow Groove 43, the sample rate, the number of channels, the bit depth, and it will show you starting and stopping the WAV uh, playing system. It will also show starting and stopping a synth um, session. If you ever have any problems with your plugin, your, your plugin freezes at some point, take a look at the status window to see where it was when that happened. That will give you a good indication of at least where to go start looking to debug your code. So this is kind of a, a little helper window over here. Over in the modules menu, you're going to find a bunch of built-in plugins. All of these first ones are straight out of my FX book. So if you're using these plugins, they're the identical algorithms in the um, uh, second edition audio FX book from Focal Press. The last two here, Impulse Convolver and FIR Designer, are special kinds of plugins that allow you to do convolution and design FIR filters while playing audio through them all in real time. So these are specialized tools. Um, you really kind of need to know what you're doing as far as understanding these, um, these technologies to use those. I'm going to load the multi-filter up. And this is a whole bunch of different types of filters, low pass, high pass, shelving filters, and constant Q and non-constant Q parametric EQ filters. Let me load the low pass filter 2 up. I'm going to play audio through it and move the controls around. For the low pass filter 2, the boost cut control isn't going to do anything, but I'm going to use FC and Q for that. Okay, pop quiz, why are we getting all those clicks and pops down here when we have a low FC and a higher Q? And the answer is we have a whole lot of energy in the audio signal down at these low frequencies. So a Q of 3.43 is only going to give me maybe 4 or 5 dB of gain, but at these low frequencies where most of the energy is in the signal, it's causing distortion. So that's what you were hearing right there. So the FC and Q controls work here, and you can select a bunch of different filter types. The reason I pulled this up was to show you 
Again, another way to do a sort of a sanity check and make sure your system is running, here are automatic plugins you can load and, and try out. A bigger reason is because of the analyzer window in RackAFX. It's one of the most powerful parts of RackAFX, and you can access it right here with the scope button. There's also the analyzer button, which is over here. You can access it from the analyzer pane where it says big analyzer right here. So here is the analyzer. It has an operation where it will do impulse and frequency response testing of the plugin that you have loaded. So I've got this second order low pass filter loaded. If I hit the frequency button here, it will shoot an impulse into the plugin and then take an FFT of that and give me their frequency response. So my FC is about 20, 2300 hertz or 2.3K, which is right about there. Q is 8.59, so I've got this gain. If you click on the waveform, you can drag the mouse, and it will then give you a readout of the points on the waveform. So I can see that my peak frequency, if I read off of here, is right at about 2.2299, which is what the control is set to. There's a max frequency counter here that uses the FFT. As you change the resolution of the FFT, this max frequency value will get closer and closer and closer to the truth. Uh, you have to know on FFT works to understand that. When you shoot an impulse response into the plugin and take an FFT of it, it will do this anytime you touch any of the controls here. So as I drag the FC control back and forth, it's going to repeatedly fire impulses and take FFTs in order to make this plot for you. As I drag the Q knob up and down, it's going to be doing the exact same thing. So whenever you move the control by even a single pixel, it's going to go back in, take an FFT, and give you the response here. So if I pull this down and I back off on my frequency and look at the impulse response, this is what I get. And as I turn up the center frequency in Q, then I get the ringing that you learn about in your DSP classes when you talk about um, filters and Q and how they affect the transient response of the signal. Speaking of which, there's also a step response right here. This is the step response. It has been normalized, so the peak is right here. You can unnormalize that over here um, in IR graphic options. It says normalize TD responses. If you unclick that, it will then give you the true step response, and you can see that the peak is actually off the graph a little bit here, but it does eventually ring out to a value of 1.0 for the step response there. There's also a phase response. And you can likewise drag and click the mouse along the phase response and read off the phase shift through the filter with that. And likewise, it also works with the Q control that we have right here. All right, so um, this is kind of the way that the analyzer works. And there's a whole bunch of different things that you can do with this. There's the hide control button, including the, the impulse convolver, the FIR designer, and all that other stuff. I'm going to save that for another tutorial later on some of the more advanced things. There's also a built-in stereo delay here. So I can turn this up. Now, one thing to listen for is the analog swoosh as I move this control around. The parameter smoothing that was set up on this control is for about a second and a half. So that parameter smoothing prevents a lot of glitches and clicks and pops, and it s slows down how, how fast the delay time moves. For some signals, it sounds a lot like an analog uh, delay where you hear the kind of the swooshing noise. We didn't get as much as I wanted of at that time, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna harp on it. And so I think that this gives you a good a good idea of where to get started. You have these built-in filters, and you have uh, an audio system get, to get used to learning how to play and stop and and rewind. One more thing, the bypass switch is right here. So there's no delay. And then here is with all the delays. There's a little bit of a tail time on this uh, plugin as well, so when you hit stop, you can hear the cascading echoes as they sort of delay away from it. So I am going to stop the plugin here. We'll go ahead and do our very first real project development in the next video. You should use this video, though, to make sure everything is configured and set up and ready to rock.